if you can't remember what you need to buy, the store you start writing out a pretty extensive shopping list. Bookmarks on where you are in a book, we almost all do that anyway. Uh, you have a calendar where you note birthdays, even the birthdays of your children. Uh, telephone numbers that you should know, you write them down and you have them convenient. There are memory tricks that you might use, such as sort of the Jerry Lucas many years ago talked about actually putting, uh, kind of putting images above the faces of individuals and trying to remember what, who, what their names were and certain things about them based on some of these images they would put above them. Um, mental images of various types, resilience. Uh, you just may ask for help. Um, I, I, I once treated a fairly prominent individual uh, who had uh, a little more than mild cognitive impairment and he was well known and people would come in and said, I bet you don't remember who I am. <laughs> and his typical answer to that was, if you can't remember your name, I certainly am not going to tell you. So there are just little tricks that you might use to, to kind of get you through. Uh, time becomes a factor. Uh, slow down your speech. Uh, read more slowly so you can actually pick up things a little bit better than you can. And then you just may take a little more effort in conversations, concentration, and trying hard to remember things. I mean, quite honestly, I, we were at lunch earlier today. I'm 72, um, and I was trying to record, remember some names. And so I, there were a couple that I stumbled over, people I should know very well. A minute later, I remembered the name. That's a very typical thing to see with cognitive aging. And another area that we may look at is our individuals using, att making attempts at cognitive enhancement. And this has become a big industry. I'm going to say a word or two about this a little bit later. But things like drugs, you know, caffeine would be a good example, but people have tried to use other drugs too. Stimulants, methamphetamines, and methamphetamine uh, or amphetamines, not a good idea, but people do it. Uh, and one thing, people are using transcranial magnetic stimulation. I just don't think we have the evidence yet that this really helps that much. But nevertheless, people are beginning to do this. And now let's talk a little bit about risk factors. So we've got this process that affects virtually everybody, but we're not, but we saw considerable variation. So if we see variation, then maybe there are areas that are risk where we can intervene. So what do we know about risk factors in terms of cognitive aging? We're not talking about risk for Alzheimer's disease, and we're not talking about risk for mild cognitive impairment. They very well may be the same, but they very well may not be. So we have to keep that in mind as we go through this. So educational development uh, could very well be a risk factor. Uh, adverse child and adolescent ex exposures, whether you actually were exposed to literature or reading or certain types of cognitive stimulation would be one. Uh, early mental health conditions in individuals, parental occupations, uh, did you have a lot of books around the house, et cetera, environmental exposures of various types? And then there's a whole collection of other things that we could look at. I'm not going to go through all of these, but things like medications. Uh, are you taking anticholinergic medication? Probably one of the biggest drugs that creates cognitive problems <coughs> for older persons is an over-the-counter drug that many older persons take for sleep, and that's uh, uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl. And so it's a, it, it's a, people will just go in and buy Benadryl. It makes you drowsy. It's not, a, it's not an actual sleeping pill because it doesn't keep you asleep, but it will actually put you to sleep. And so things like that, they may use alcohol in the same way. Hospitalizations, we don't. I'll show you a slide in just a moment. Hospitalization, for any reason, for a period of time, there's a potential for increased decline in cognition following hospitalization. Infections, alcohol abuse, delirium is a big one, and it's one we really emphasize greatly in our report. Hearing and vision loss, it's been cognitive aging, it's been connected to both. Uh, sleep disorders and sleep apnea, uh, and we see some of the other ones. Vascular, I want to mention specifically because that's the area that I think you may, as a group, have an interest in. And then multimodal problems. Older persons don't just often have one problem, they've got multiple problems. And looking at these multiple problems would be another to look at. Depression, uh, head trauma, 
uh, genetic factors. Older adults are prescribed 14 drugs on average at any given time. This is really a lot, and so you've got to look at those drugs and see whether they're uh, important. And I mentioned already high-risk medications, setting hypnotics, benzodiazepines, and the anticholinergics specifically, uh, such as diphenhydramine. Okay, so here's just this is one. This is just looking at what happens with hospitalization. You think, hey, big deal. I go in for a hernia operation. I'm 75. I need the operation. Shouldn't make any difference. I have to undergo general anesthesia. Uh, and I come out from the anesthesia, but on average, you're going to have more trouble with cognition if you are in the hospital. Generally, that improves with time, but initially, over a period of time, maybe weeks, your cognition is not going to be quite what it was otherwise. It happened to me, probably may have happened to some of you. I was in the hospital, I was, I was dean at the time of medical education at Duke, and uh, I had a bleeding ulcer. I went in the hospital. I was in the hospital about three or four days. I came out, and I, I still remember the. Um, I had a TV in the room. I really couldn't concentrate enough to read, so I thought I'd occupy myself with TV. And I knew I was making progress when I finally understood the theme of happy days. <laughs> so, so there is a period where you just you just cannot cognitively keep up. And then you gradually regain some of that function. And regaining that function may take not just a couple of days, it may take weeks and perhaps even months as you go through this. So one of the keys of an IOM report are the recommendations that we make. And I'm not going to go through all the recommendations that we have, and I'm not going to go through all the details that we have, but I tried to pick out some that I think are especially relevant to epidemiology but also relevant to uh, sort of the public health view of cognitive aging. So one, expand research on the trajectories of cognitive aging and improve tools to use to assess cognitive changes and effects on daily function. So the real question is here, we really believe more longitudinal studies are needed. A lot of that may be able to be done with existing studies where you can add in cognitive tests but one of the challenges in this situation is deciding well, what are the tests that we should add in? What are the things that we should be testing that really will give us a good window into what's happening in terms of cognitive aging? And strengthen efforts to collect and disseminate population-based data on cognitive aging. Uh, and we really made the point of focusing on cognitive health as opposed to dementia. Most of the epidemiologic studies have to do with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias or at least mild cognitive impairment. We're saying there need to be studies kind of at the upper end and really looking at cognitive aging as a whole. Uh, we need operational definitions. We've given a definition here, but it's not operational. It's sort of giving you a general idea in this report, but operationalizing that in terms of how you perform on a particular test would be very important. Um, Try to look at representative surveys of diverse populations. I mean, one nice thing about Eric is that they have a, a, a sample of African Americans that's very important, but there need to be other types of samples in there to look at what the differences are. Uh, so we also recommended that the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission in conjunction with other relevant federal, excuse me, federal agencies and consumer organizations should determine the appropriate regulatory review policies and guidelines for over-the-counter medications and interventions that do not target a disease but may assert claims of cognitive impairment. Now, what we're talking about here are drugs like Benadryl or some of the other drugs that very well can cause significant cognitive problems and maybe finding a way to increase the awareness of the public regarding the use of these drugs if cognition is a problem. And we're talking about the products that are out there, the many brain games. I will not mention them by name, but if you listen to NPR, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they're out there. There are a lot of them out there. And I do have a word or two to say about that toward the end. Uh, promote cognitive health in regular medical and wellness visits. Uh, the Affordable Care Act recommends an annual evaluation, a wellness visit 
And we are recommending that within that wellness visit, that cognition be tested. The preventative task force does not recommend that. We feel like they're making a mistake. We feel that there needs to be some brief screen of cognition when individual, older individuals come in for their health and wellness visit for their annual review. So that's another recommendation that we have. Another is to look at ways we can help individuals who might be at, uh, at some risk given cognitive aging. Now this could also apply to Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. And I want to specifically mention the, where this might fit into cognitive aging itself. So, areas of financial decision making, and I'm going to come back to that one in just a moment. Driving and transportation. So you might be able to pass your driving test, but that does not mean you can drive everywhere that you have driven in the past in the way that you've driven. A story I like to tell is another patient that I had. Um, turns out that this patient uh, lived in an area near where I would occasionally go play golf. And so I knew he was driving by himself in to see me and I turned in, I knew exactly where his neighborhood was, I turned in to the area where his neighborhood was located and uh, realized he had to come out through that road in order to get onto a main highway. The main highway was a four-lane divided highway that was very busy. He had to turn left in order to come out of that to come to do it. And so I, having, he knew that I went down there and played golf, and I mentioned that I, you know, I noticed this turn that he made. And I said, I'm just a little nervous about you making that turn. And he said, oh, I can make that turn. And I said, well, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you do your family a favor? Why don't you turn right out of here and go down to the next place you can kind of make a U-turn so that you can come left? Simple thing to do. But at the same time, I, I was very concerned that he could easily have an automobile accident because he was having to make three simultaneous decisions. Who's coming from the left? Who's coming from the right? Who's coming from the crossroad? And how much time do I have to get across there and make that left turn? So simple things like that we need to be paying attention to. And I think the DOT and, and other groups need to be aware of that. Technology. Um, computer programs are, are, are wonderful. Now, virtually everybody in this room, except me, uh, can just go right in and you can do whatever you want to do on a computer and it's just absolutely intuitive. But older persons have problems with this. And so finding simple, user-friendly programs to do the things that older people might enjoy doing and need to be doing using their computer, their smartphone, their uh, iPad, etc. That's something that we really need to consider more. And health information. Older people are going uh, and want to use these websites. They don't know how to get to them. But having good, simple websites where they can read and understand what is being said about topics such as cognitive aging is very important. Now, messages for the public. And these were sort of the evidence-based messages that we came up with. All right, the brain changes just like every other part of the body. So you're aging, we're all aging, and your brain is aging just like your back is aging, just like your legs are aging, just like your knees are aging. So that was lesson number one. Cognitive aging is not a disease. Just your aging itself is not a disease. But you do have to make some adjustments. You have to think about what's happening to your body over time because of aging. Cognitive aging is different for every individual. And so if you go read something and it says, this is what's going to happen to you when it reaches the age of 75, don't believe it. It may or may not happen because you're different. Everybody is different. You need to be aware of what could be happening, but you don't need to assume that that's you. Another message, some cognitive functions improve with aging. We're really getting that message across, wisdom. Uh, knowledge of certain types often <clears throat> increase and so because this is where the professor and the role still uh, just because you can't maybe do some of the specifics you used to do before you actually may have more 
one, one good friend of mine is a very prominent scientist at Duke. And we get together periodically and talk about aging. He's about my age. And he realizes he's lost his edge. In other words, he's just not on top of everything that's going on. And he's discouraged about that because he once was at the top of his field, and now he's no longer quite at the top. So we've talked about, you know, you've got something to add to your field that you just may not be tapping into a bigger picture that these younger persons who know the techniques you don't know can take advantage of. So that's an issue. There are steps patients can take to protect their cognitive health, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this. I'm not going to go this uh, uh, through this again. But these were the top three actions we felt people in the public need to know that may be value that should be valuable in terms of helping them maybe improve their cognition or at least to retard the slope of the decline that they're experiencing. And they're very simple and straightforward. In fact, they sound almost like what you would hear for cardiovascular disease and some other areas. Number one, clearly, exercise. That comes up more clearly than anything else. Number two, reduce cardiovascular risk factors. Very clear in the literature. Number three, manage your medications. We talked about that. As I mentioned, this, this laundry list of medications that many older persons are taking is one that needs to be dealt with, and we need to look at that. Uh, every individual needs to talk to her or his physician about that. There's some other things where the evidence didn't quite reach the level that these first three reached, but we still feel to be important. Uh, be socially and intellectually active, and continually seek opportunities to learn. So we felt that was important. Get adequate sleep and seek professional treatment for sleep disorders if needed. No question, a sleep disorder can interfere with cognition. So a true sleep disorder, their intervention would be helpful. Take your health care provider, talk to your health care provider to learn more about preventing delirium. Delirium is a, a major concern. We had probably the U.S. leading uh, delirium expert on our panel, Sharon Inouye, and she kept pushing this issue, and she's absolutely right. The frequency of delirium is high. And we need to do everything we can to prevent it. And there are ways that delirium can be prevented. So that, that was number three, given, again, the hospitalizations, all the purpose had, et cetera. Now I want to talk a little bit about financial issues uh, to kind of end up here. Uh, best estimate right now is that something like close to $3 billion a year uh, are subject to fraud perpetuated on older adults. And this is a tragedy, but it's one that's out there and it's just happening continually. And we need to do something about that. So we made a recommendation, as I mentioned before, that this is something the Federal Trade Commission really needs to take a good look at. And they do have some powers to do something about this. Uh, but you know, you, probably all of you have a story, I have a story. Uh, not story, not for me, but for my mother-in-law, who's 92. She gets a call, uh, and she, it says IRS on the uh, thing. She picks it up, and the woman says, you, you owe X number of taxes, and if you don't pay these taxes within the next two days, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have to, you're going to go to jail. And so she, uh, thankfully, said, I need to talk to my son and daughter about this. And so she hung up the phone, called my wife, and called uh, uh, my brother-in-law. And it was clearly a fraud. But these frauds, for older people now who have a, takes them a little more time to think through and reason, Virtually all of these frauds are based on you've got to make a decision, you've got to make an action. And so that just that, that's this perfect storm for problems occurring, and it is a major problem. And if a person's having some cognitive impairment secondary to cognitive aging, 
then they are at greater risk. And that really means that virtually all older persons, as they get older, and we see more individuals living into their 80s and 90s, they're going to be at even greater risk. So we feel like something really needs to be done there, if at all possible. So another one, I want to end up here with brain stimulation games, um, because this is the topic that uh, there was a, a, not within our committee, but we got a lot of challenges outside about what we were going to say about brain stimulation games. And our basic message was, we don't know whether these work or not. And there are three things I would like for, we, we tried to make clear in terms of brain stimulation games. Number one, there is not, we didn't look at each individual brain stimulation game because there are a lot of them out there. But overall, it appears that there's not good evidence that you can transfer what you've done with the brain stimulation game over to the rest of your life. And that's really key. So, for example, I, there's no question you can improve your memory function playing a particular game. Okay? You do better at that. And virtually everybody can. But whether that means you're remembering better outside the game is another question altogether. So that's one thing we don't have the evidence for yet. Second thing is that brain stimulation games, we don't know whether they actually last after the game has been completed. So let's say you participate in one of these exercises three or four times a week for six months and then you stop. And then six months later, you're tested against a control who did not get involved in that. And there's no evidence yet that you actually see longitudinal improvements. And there are bits and pieces of evidence that give hints that there may be